I'm Dean Christian Johnson. It's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you here for our John Gettet Annual Lecture Series. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to take a moment to introduce John Gettet, who was the founding dean of the law school back in 1989, and his lovely wife. John, can you? <laughs> the, uh, this annual series was named in uh, Professor Gettet's honor, and it's been a terrific and one of our signature events that we have here at the law school. I'd also like to thank, of course, all of the great Widener staff that make these events possible. In particular, Sandy Graff, who spends a great deal of time getting things organized and, and ready to go. And finally, I'd like to thank in particular Professor Jill Family, who is the director of our Law and Government Institute and is in charge of putting this all together. And uh, Jill will introduce our speaker today. Thank you so much to Dean Johnson, to all my um, colleagues on the faculty here at Widener, to all of our alumni, including the alumni who are here today for this um, lecture. I also want to express my thanks to Sandy, who is just um, an unbelievable help in running the Law and Government Institute, um, Brian Furball. Also, um, our Getted Fellow, Jenna Moscato, who you may have met. There she is. You may have met her on your way in. And then we have two Patrick J. Murphy Fellows, um, Sia Georgiakopoulos and Lindsay Eichinger. And Lindsay, if you could raise your hand, she's going to be very important at the end because during the question and answer period, she has a microphone and we ask that you wait to ask your question until you have the microphone um, because PCN, the Pennsylvania C Cable Network, is here and they will... Um, the audience at home won't be able to hear you unless you use the microphone. Thank you as well to PCN for being here today and broadcasting this lecture. So welcome. This is the 12th annual Getted Lecture, if you can believe that. Um, as Dean Johnson said, this lecture series honors John Getted, who is one of the founders of our law school and the founder of the Law and Government Institute. These lectures celebrate government law, as well as John Gettid's enthusiasm and support for our law school and for developing legal scholars. The Law and Government Institute is all about public service. The Institute is dedicated to the study of government law, including the role of lawyers in the making and implementation of laws. At Widener Law Commonwealth, students may earn a certificate in government law in addition to their JD degree. Government law is fused into our curriculum here at Weiner Law Commonwealth. The Institute's mission is founded on the idea that government works, that government is a positive force in our society. At Weiner Law Commonwealth, we train lawyers to be a part of that positive force. We are so glad that John and his wife Carol are here with us this afternoon. And as we do um, every year, I want to formally present John um, with a signed flyer from today's lecture as we've been collecting them for 12 years. So I'm going to give that to him and then I'm going to have a little present um, for Carol as well because Carol um, has been a great support of the law school as well. So after the lecture, we welcome all of you to join us for a reception in the gallery. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Munir Ahmed is Clinical Professor of Law and Deputy Dean for Experiential Education at Yale Law School. He is also the Legal Director of the Jerome N. Frank Legal Service Organization at Yale. He and his students represent clients in immigration and labor matters. His recent litigation includes the first lawsuit to challenge President Trump's 2017 executive order that abruptly cut off travel to the United States by nationals of Muslim-majority nations. Professor Ahmed and his students were in court within hours of the implementation of the executive order. He and his students also have been leading litigation against President Trump's revocation of the policy known as DACA, which stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. He is also an active scholar 
His scholarly work examines national security, human rights, and citizenship. It is an honor to call Professor Ahmed a friend and a colleague. Please join me in welcoming Professor Munir Ahmed. Good afternoon. I'm really delighted uh, to be here with all of you today to uh, deliver the John L. Gated lecture. I'd especially like to thank Professor Jill Family, um, uh, not just for the kind introduction, but for being a friend and colleague and really a treasure to uh, the National Immigration Law Professoriate. Um, and I'm really delighted to, to be here um, at her invitation and in conversation with all of you. I also want to thank uh, Dean Johnson and Professor Gedded. Uh, and I want to thank Sandy Graff for helping to, uh, to get me here today. Um, I'm going to speak from the experience of litigating these two cases that Professor Family just referred to um, over the past year. Uh, cases that I have been litigating with my students, colleagues, and peers at our partner organizations. The first involves the first challenge to uh, the first Muslim ban. And the second concerns an ongoing legal challenge to the termination of the program known as DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. One way to understand the Muslim ban litigation is as a claim of rights by Muslim immigrants. And one way to understand the DACA litigation is as a claim of rights by young undocumented immigrants, the majority from Mexico and other parts of Latin America. But while both of those descriptions are true, because these cases arise in the immigration context, they relate inescapably to questions of who we are as a country. The fundamental questions of immigration law, whom do we admit, whom do we exclude, whom do we remove, what duties and obligations do we owe to non-citizens, and what duties and obligations do non-citizens owe to us? These questions help to define our sense of national identity, constitute our understanding of fairness, and determine our future. And so while there's a great deal at stake for the litigants in each of the two cases that I'll talk about, there's immensely more at stake for the nation as a whole. So in my comments today, I hope to persuade you that the current moment of fraught, divisive, and emotionally charged debate about immigration is a critical flashpoint in American history and holds the opportunity to affirm a set of values that are essential to our collective well-being. And I want to suggest that we can find models to guide us through the current legal and political moment of our history, and specifically models in Pennsylvania and the history of Pennsylvania. So let me begin with a brief description of the Muslim ban litigation, focusing in particular on the case in which my students, colleagues, and I were involved. When the first Muslim ban was announced late in the afternoon on Friday, January 27th, 2017, one week to the day after the presidential inauguration, it quickly led to chaos. The executive order was hastily drafted, inadequately vetted, and rolled out at airports across the country with only haphazard guidance to frontline customs and border protection officials. Within hours, those officials were detaining and excluding from the country various people pursuant to the ban, including green card holders and dual citizens. I'll start with the legal story. Importantly, the refugee and Muslim ban executive order issued on January 27th of last year was the third of three immigration-related executive orders that were issued in that first week of the administration. And while I'll focus my comments on the last order, the other two are hugely consequential and hugely relevant, and so I want to mention them briefly as well. On January 25th, 2017, the President issued one executive order focused on border security and a second focused on interior immigration enforcement. The former garnered attention because it commits to building the infamous wall, but also tucked into that order are provisions designed to make asylum more difficult to obtain for migrants crossing the southern border, primarily those from the northern triangle region of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. The latter order 
garnered attention because of its promise to crack down on so-called sanctuary cities by withdrawing federal funds to jurisdictions that have refused to deploy their law enforcement resources in support of the federal government's deportation machine. But tucked into that order are provisions that drastically revamp the Department of Homeland Security's priorities for deportation of non-citizens, making essentially any not undocumented person a priority. And if so, if everyone is a priority, then there really are no priorities at all. And the result is to authorize immigration and customs enforcement officials to arrest, detain, and deport whomever they want. And that is very much what we've seen over the past 15 months. So the Muslim ban, the third of these three orders, issued on January 27th, has to be read in concert with these two prior orders. Because taken together, they promise to dramatically close our borders to immigrants generally and refugees specifically, and to unleash on communities across the country a deportation force. And that is the right term to use. That will tear communities apart. Looking back today, 15 months later, we can see that those orders have served as a blueprint for executing a vision of immigration enforcement designed to dramatically alter the composition of the country. The racial composition, the national and ethnic composition, and the religious composition. What made the Muslim ban executive order different from the other two is that it was the first to be visibly implemented. And as such, it was the first to produce directly observable human suffering. So what exactly did that first Muslim ban do and what happened as a result? Let me start with what the order says. First, the, frame was, uh, the, the order was framed explicitly in terms of national security. Its title, as you can see on the slide, is protecting the nation from foreign terrorist uh, entry into the United States. The order imposed a 120-day moratorium on, refugee on the refugee resettlement program as a whole. It indefinitely suspended entry of Syrian refugee refugees based on a finding that Syrian refugees were, quote, detrimental to the interests of the United States. It placed a cap on total refugee admissions at 50,000 for fiscal year 2017. The prior cap had been 110,000. It imposed a 90-day suspension of entry into the United States of non-citizens from seven countries, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen and provided for authority for the government to add to that list. Now, of course, those were not all of the Muslim-majority countries in the world, but they are all Muslim-majority countries. And there's abundant evidence to suggest that this is how the administration intended to fill its explicit campaign promise of imposing a complete and total shutdown on Muslim immigrants. You might recall at one point candidate Trump saying, quote, I think Islam hates us. The order also um, remarkably expressed a religious preference for Christians over Muslims. Um, and finally, the order conflated Syrian refugees, Islam, and terrorism. The result was a penumbra of suspicion that encompassed all refugees, Muslim or not, and was plainly motivated by animus toward Muslims, and was both fueled by and added fuel to a xenophobia that jeopardizes all immigrants. Well, so that's what the order said. I want to turn now to what the order did. On the day that the order was issued, at that moment, all across the world, people who f fell into the categories of exclusion were in transit to the United States when the order was announced and then frantically and erratically implemented. And those were the key ingredients of the chaos that followed because people were already in transit based on visas that had already been issued, subject to processes they had already completed, and vetting that had already been done. But all of that was yanked out from underneath the folks, and done so through haphazard instruction to frontline government officials. U.S. family members were uh, awaiting their loved ones in airports, and they were the first ones to discover the problem. And so at about 10 o'clock at night, um, 
on Friday, January 27th, our clinic got a call from one of our alums, a remarkable woman named Becca Heller, who is the head of an organization called the International Refugee Assistance Project, or IRAP. Becca reported that one of IRAP's clients, a man named Hamid Khalid Darish, was being detained at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York, solely on the basis of the Muslim ban. Now, Mr. Darish was an Iraqi citizen. He had been granted something known as a Special Immigrant Visa, or SIV, that was available, made available to him by virtue of his service to the United States military as an interpreter, engineer, and contractor for over a decade. That service put his life in danger in Iraq, and that service and the danger, the jeopardy that it created, was then the basis for the visa that he was granted to come to the United States. He went through literally years of vetting to get that visa. And so when you hear the term extreme vetting, you might consider that extreme vetting has been part of the system all along. By 11 p.m. that Friday night, a group of my colleagues and I, along with our students and lawyers from the ACLU, the National Immigration Law Center, and IRAP, were on the phone to plot a legal strategy. Our students and colleagues worked literally through the night. And at 5.33 a.m. the next morning, we filed a nationwide class action habeas corpus lawsuit on behalf of all individuals detained anywhere in the country on the basis of the Muslim ban. Later that day, Saturday, the, 20, uh, uh, the 28th, um, the government released Mr. Dawish and our second named plaintiff, a man named Haider al Shawi, in an attempt to moot out our case. We then filed a motion to stay the executive order as applied to anyone at any US airport. Meanwhile, a team of our students prepared template habeas petitions for lawyers to use in individual cases, and indeed, dozens of individual habeas cases on behalf of um, dozens of individual individuals held at airports were filed using those papers. Another team of students participated in a nationwide press teleconference, and still others briefed a coalition of Arab, Muslim, and South Asian community-based organizations and advocates about the litigation. In those first hours after the ban went into effect, hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteer lawyers and law students fanned out to airports across the country in order to assist individuals and families caught up in the ban. Here you can see um, lawyers from IRAP um, who are sitting on the floor providing legal advice to people at Kennedy Airport. Just as important, and maybe even more important, tens of thousands of people showed up at airports big and small to stand in solidarity with Muslims and refugees, to stand in opposition to the new administration, and to shape the political conditions in which the legal challenges would be heard. This was not just anti-Trump sentiment. Rather, there were specific claims being made about inclusion and non-discrimination. And not just at the big airports, like JFK, or San Francisco, or Chicago here, or Dulles. It also is going on at small and regional airports around the country. That Sunday, I had to fly down to um, Florida for a pre previously scheduled trip, and I flew out of the Hartford International Airport. Hartford International Airport because there was a flight to Toronto or something like that. There were a 1,000 people protesting when I showed up at the Hartford International Airport. I don't think I've ever seen a 1,000 people in the Hartford International Airport before. I was going down to Florida to Miami to give a talk, but I was um, actually flying into the Palm Beach International Airport uh, to visit my parents. Um, Palm Beach International Airport because they have a couple of flights to the Bahamas. I landed there and there were hundreds of people who were protesting at that airport. As sites of admission, the airports were transformed into performative spaces and became the sites for configuration of protest and contestation. And I want to suggest that these were not purely spontaneous protests. 
there were at least a few things that were going on that produced this moment. One was that there were a number of organizations all around the country that have been engaged in grassroots organizing on a wide variety of issues, including immigrant and racial justice, such that when this moment of crisis came around, they already were educated about the issues. They already had built a network of supporters and knew how to, to harness the so, uh, use of social media and traditional media so that they could turn out people in large numbers when it mattered. But I want to suggest that there was something else going on. These protests, the airport protests, were going on on Saturday, January 28th. Exactly one week before that, Saturday, January 21st, was the Women's March. The Women's March is across the country, but particularly the Women's March in Washington, D.C. And I want to suggest that there was a through line from the Women's March on January 21st to the airport protests on January 28th. Something has been afoot in the country for a while now. Well, <clears throat> returning to the litigation, staying on that Saturday, January 28th, Shortly after 7 p.m. on a Saturday night, Judge Ann Donnelly in the U.S. District Court in Brooklyn held a Saturday night hearing in the courthouse. And I was the one who called um, to ask for the hearing. I didn't know that someone would pick up the phone at the courthouse on a Saturday afternoon, but they did. And there was a duty judge who was on, uh, posted in case of emergency. And I said, we filed a lawsuit against the Muslim ban. And the clerk said, we've seen the papers. And I said, we'd like a hearing. And the clerk said, when can you be here? And I said, well, what time is available? And they said, call the government and tell the government that the judge would like to see you at 7 p.m. And so that's what we did. And I made one more call after that to the court security office. And I said, Judge Donnelly set a hearing for 7 p.m. tonight. I realize it's a Saturday, but are people allowed to come and watch the hearing? And they put me on hold and said, let me check. And they came back and they said, this is a public courthouse. This is a public hearing. How many people do you expect to come? I said, I couldn't hazard a guess. Maybe some dozens. They said, well, tell people to get here early. And so when that hearing began at 7 o'clock on a Saturday night, some thousands of people who had been at JFK Airport were redirected to Cadman Plaza in Brooklyn. The hundreds that could get in filled the courtroom. And the remainder marched and chanted outside. And shortly after 8 p.m., Judge Donnelly issued a nationwide stay, enjoining the detention or exclusion of anyone on the basis of the Muslim Ban Executive Order. This was roughly 22 hours after we began working on the case. I often tell my students that if they've ever thought about doing something other than law, this might be enough, the time to try it because it will never get as good as that. Um, the idea that you could get a nationwide injunction within 24 hours of beginning work on a case. Well, it turns out that the nationwide injunction wasn't enough. This is a picture um, taken in our law clinic that Saturday night. <clears throat> and even after the order was issued, the government was not in compliance. And so we spent much of that Saturday night after it was issued, literally trying to turn planes around. What's going on in this moment is that we had been contacted by an Iranian woman who was on a plane on the runway at JFK. And she was communicating to a cousin that the plane was getting ready to take off. She was being sent back to Iran, and she was terrified. And so we tried however we could to get the government to honor the nationwide injunction. The US Attorney's Office assured us it's being honored at JFK. We said, that's not the information we have. We're literally on the phone right now with somebody on the plane 
going down the runway. They said, well, all of our information says that the Muslim ban is not being enforced. But we knew that it was. And so students in this picture were calling the airline, Ukraine, Ukrainian Airlines, as it turned out. We called them in Ukraine to try to get them to stop the plane. It didn't work. We called TSA, thinking maybe we could find someone there who could help. It didn't work. We called the gate officials. Um, it didn't work. The woman on the other end of the phone, on the plane, um, uh, fearing her return to, to Iran, was growing ever more desperate. And frankly, so were we. Finally, in a fit of desperation, as we're trying to rack our brains and think, who can stop a plane from taking off? We thought, air traffic control. Air traffic control can stop a plane. So the student who's standing there in the middle with his phone up, so first year student, he had been in our clinic for all of three weeks at this time. He tracked down the number for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which controls air traffic control, uh, uh, runs air traffic control at JFK Airport. He got on the phone with someone there, and he said, there's a court order that prevents that plane from taking off. That was not entirely correct. <laughs> But it was pretty close. <laughs> and he was pretty persuasive. And the person on the other end of the phone said, one moment, please. Let me talk to a supervisor. And a supervisor came on the phone. And the student said, there's a court order that prevents that plane from taking off. I said, well, again, not quite right, but pretty close. And we explained the circumstances. We explained the order. The supervisor put us on hold. And a couple minutes later, he came back and said, the plane is turning around. It's going back to the gate. And about five minutes later, the US Attorney's Office called us and said, OK, we managed to get that plane turned around. It's going back to the gate. <laughs> I don't know whose efforts worked. Um, but I will tell you that um, that old uh, you know, saying about um, uh, in, uh, desperation breeding inspiration was absolutely true. Um, because we, uh, as much as I can laugh about it now, in that moment, really all that we could think about was this voice on the other end of the line growing increasingly desperate, thinking that she was going to be sent back to persecution on the basis of an order that some hours earlier a federal judge had said could not be enforced. Well. In the course of just a few days after that, dozens of new lawsuits were challenged against that first ban. And as many of you know, the first Muslim ban executive order was replaced by a second Muslim ban executive order on March 6th. And then eventually, that second Muslim ban executive order was replaced with a Muslim ban proclamation, each time engendering further litigation. And that litigation continues today. Our clinic's work on the first Muslim ban was quickly overtaken by those other cases. And as more and more lawyers flooded into that space and new developments arose, we receded into the background. But we did so having made one important mark in stopping and really arresting the momentum of the administration one week um, into its rule on an issue of incredible importance to the people involved, but an issue of incredible symbolic importance for the country as a whole. I want to turn now <clears throat> to the litigation that we've done with respect to DACA, and then turn back and try to link these two experiences together. So on September 5th of last year, the administration announced the termination of the DACA program. <laughs> DACA, as you may know, was created by the Obama administration in 2012 to provide interim relief from deportation and work authorization for nearly one million young undocumented immigrants. Many of these indiv individuals, popularly known as dreamers, came to the United States as young children, and this is the only country they've ever known. Across the political spectrum, they are described as Americans in all ways except on paper. And by any reasonable measure, the program has been an enormous success. 
It has allowed dreamers to enroll in college, to work in order to support themselves and their families, to purchase homes, to participate in their communities, and to live day to day without the constant fear of being torn from their families, put on a bus or a plane to a country they've never meaningfully known to live out the rest of their days. Candidate Trump spoke positively about dreamers both before and after his election. And for the first eight months, even as his administration canceled other immigration programs, they left DACA intact. Then, abruptly, they announced that they were terminating the program, cutting off new applications for DACA and imposing a small window of time for people who already had DACA to renew their status. On the day of the announcement, the Attorney General had a press conference and the Secretary of Homeland Security issued a statement, both providing a hodgepodge of contradictory, illogical, and in our view, pretextual reasons for the termination. The same day that the administration made its announcement, ill-considered, shoddily reasoned, and hugely consequential for the lives of millions of individuals and millions of more in their families and communities. Our clinic, along with uh, partner organizations, Make the Road New York and the National Immigration Law Center, filed our notice of intent to sue, claiming that the government's actions were arbitrary and capricious in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. <clears throat> this is our lead plaintiff, Martin Bataille Vidal, a young Latino dreamer who, by virtue of uh, his having joined a lawsuit related to DACA a year earlier, had developed the skills to be an eloquent and effective spokesperson for himself, for his community, for the issue of DACA, for the plight of dreamers, and for a notion of the American dream, the same dream that the dreamers are named after. Likewise, our organizational client, Make the Road New York, was situated to educate its members about the lawsuit and mobilize them around it. This is a rally that was held just around the corner from the courthouse um, before one of our hearings in Brooklyn. And um, you can see pictures of dreamers with their family members. Um, and that's Martine, our, our lead plaintiff, who's speaking to the crowd. <clears throat> this partnership with these membership-based organizations allowed our students to both experience and participate in the complex, challenging alchemy of law and social movements and to see the value of advocacy both inside and outside the courtroom and to learn the skills required for each venue. This is um, one of our students speaking at a press conference outside of the federal court just after um, completing one of our hearings. Soon after we filed our suit in federal court in New York, <clears throat> nearly a dozen other similar cases were filed around the country. Two sets of cases, one in the Northern District of California and the other um, ours in New York, have moved the fastest. In each, district court judges have issued preliminary injunctions ordering the government to continue accepting renewal applications from DACA recipients, pending a final resolution of the case. They've done so based on a finding that we're likely to succeed on the merits, establishing that the government action was arbitrary and capricious. Those cases are now pending before the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit, respectively, and may well head to the Supreme Court after that. Now, on their surface, these cases challenge the sufficiency and legitimacy of the reasons given by the government for terminating the DACA program. These claims are based on principles of liberty and transparency that underlie the Administrative Procedure Act. Namely, given the size and power of the administrative state over the lives of millions of people, including all of us here, the government bears the burden to justify its actions so as to protect against the abuse of administrative power. Such principles are especially important here, where nearly a million people have for years organized the most fundamental aspects of their lives, where they go to school, whether they have a job, how they support their families, how they pay rent, how they pay a mortgage, 
they've organized all of this around the benefits provided by the DACA policy, only to have it abruptly ripped away, and for that to happen in a political environment in which anti-immigrant, anti-Mexican, and anti-Latino animus are rampant, not least because of statements from the President. Now, there's good reason to believe that the mishmash of rationales provided by the government for the termination of DACA don't tell the true story. One way to understand the DACA termination is that it was designed to precipitate a political crisis so as to force Congress to act on immigration. And indeed, DACA has been a central issue of congressional debate over the past eight months, with the failure to reach a deal on immigration precipitating a brief government shutdown in February. The political debate around DACA, in turn, has been revealing of the larger political moment and relates back to the blueprint for dramatic demographic transformation that I spoke about at the outset of my comments. Indeed, the debate on Capitol Hill revealed that the President's expressed sympathies for DREAMers did not mean that he would support a DREAM Act, which would put DREAMers on a path to citizenship. Rather, the White House was only willing to support the DREAM Act if Congress did three things. And by Congress, really, what I mean is the Democratic minority. First, if they appropriated $25 billion to build the so-called border wall. Second, if they made permanent changes to the legal family-based immigration program. And third, if they eliminated another legal immigration program that disproportionately benefited immigrants from Africa. And so from these political machinations, which the DACA termination set into motion, one can see once more that the ultimate goal of this administration actually wasn't to address undocumented immigration, as much as that issue is talked about, but rather to transform the system of legal immigration. Taken together with a Muslim ban, the intended result is fewer Muslims, fewer refugees, fewer Latinos, fewer Asians, fewer Africans, and an overall reduction in immigration. Not just undocumented immigration, which in fact is at its lowest level in decades and has been declining for years, a trend that started in the last administration, but significantly a reduction in legal immigration. And in this regard, this administration's set of policies are remin reminiscent of past moments of nativism in our history. In particular, I want to draw attention to the Immigration Act of 1924. That may seem like, a light, like forever ago and irrelevant to what's going on today, but there's a lot to be learned from um, 20th century and in fact 19th and 18th, and as I'll get to, 17th century immigration history. Very little changes, actually. The, the characters change, the nationalities change, but the sentiments seem not to change very much. And so the Immigration Act of 1924 capped the number of immigrants that could come from any country to 2% of the people of the same nationality who were already living in the, in the country um, according to the 1890 census. So let me just pause on that for a second. What the law did is it said, let's look at what the ethnic and national composition of the country was 30 years ago. And let's key all contemporary immigration to that set of ratios. So already it was going back in time three decades. And then it was seeking to fix the ratios, the ethnic and racial and national ratios um, of the country going forward. The law was by design, and no one was hiding their views on this, to limit the number of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, in particular Italians and Slavs and Jews from Eastern Europe. Those were the targets of the Immigration Act of 1924. At the same time, it barred Asian immigrants entirely, although that wasn't much of an innovation because 
our immigration law had been barring Asian immigrants for decades at that point. It really was the focus on Eastern and Southern Europeans that was the innovation here. And it's uncontested that the basic goal of that law was to promote racial and cultural homogeneity. Again, I think the echoes um, between that law and where we are today are pretty strong. Well, as I suggested at the outset of my comments, the current moment of contentious immigration debate is hugely consequential for the future of the country. But I think our history, both negative and positive, can help us to navigate these challenges. The historian Lawrence Fuchs has written that in the colonial era, there were three distinct models for migration. First was the Massachusetts model, which premised civic membership on shared religious and cultural identity. Massachusetts at that time, in the colonial period, only allowed migration of fellow Puritans. And it rebuffed or expelled um, everyone else. I grew up in Rhode Island. Um, Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson were ejected from Massachusetts because they refused to adhere to the Puritan values of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and therefore started Rhode Island. Second is the Virginia model. The Virginia model was principally based on labor needs and actively encouraged migration of laborers and indentured servants, regardless of religious backgrounds, in order to fill the demand for cheap labor. And finally, the third model was the Pennsylvania model, which comparatively was a model of equality. As Fuchs writes, writes quote, Pennsylvania saw immigrants who would be good citizens regardless of religious background. Massachusetts wanted as members only those who were religiously pure. In Virginia, with this increasing reliance on a plantation economy, wanted workers as cheaply as it could get them without necessarily welcoming them to, the membership, to membership in the community. Although limited to only white persons, as Fuchs writes, quote, Pennsylvania, following the model, uh, following the leadership of William Penn in 1681, had by the early 18th century established a policy of encouraging immigration of Europeans regardless of their religious background and of admitting them to membership in the civic life of the colony on roughly equal terms with native born Pennsylvanians. As a result, Pennsylvania became home to Scotch-Irish Presbyterians, Baptists and Presbyterians from Wales, and a variety of German pietists. German immigrants particularly provided a linguistically and culturally diverse population. Some of you may know that German immigrants were not always so welcome in Pennsylvania by all parts. Um, Pennsylvania's most famous son, Ben Franklin, earlier on in his political career, held a fairly ethno-nationalist view of immigration, though it changed over the course of his lifetime. Fuchs describes that by 1753, <clears throat> two of the six printing houses run by Germans in Pennsylvania published in English, and two partly in English, uh, uh, two partly in English. Ben Franklin was furious that the remaining two continued to publish only in German. And Franklin said, quote, why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous so as to Germanize us instead of anglifying them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion? It doesn't take a lot of changes to that text to sound like today. There's so many people coming across the border. They'll never learn our language or our customs, and though we won't say it, they won't acquire our complexion either. That's what Ben Franklin was saying about Germans in Pennsylvania. One can hear echoes of each of the three models, the Massachusetts, the Virginia, and the Pennsylvania in our contemporary immigration politics. 
the religious intolerance on which the Muslim ban is based fits neatly within the Massachusetts model. And the racial animus directed toward Mexicans and Latino immigrants, likewise, bears a similarity to early Franklin's ethno-nationalist view. Meanwhile, the long-standing tolerance of a large, low-wage, undocumented immigrant popula labor population without incorporating them into the political community is reminiscent of the Virginia model. That leaves the Pennsylvania model, the one that ultimately triumphed when it came time to establish federal standards for naturalization in the first Congress. Of course, even that model was exclusionary as to persons of African descent. The Nat Naturalization Act of 1790 was limited to free white persons. But it nonetheless represented an affirmative vision of a society that benefited from pluralism and relied upon a commitment to shared political values rather than shared cultural or religious affinities to forge a political community. This, I want to suggest, is the moment for the Pennsylvania model to triumph once more. To be sure, the ethno-nationalist model of immigration reflected in the Muslim ban, the DACA termination, and the attempts of the administration to wholesale revamp our legal immigration system have plenty of support in, in American history, like the Immigration Act of 1924. But they need not be our future. The equality model, the Pennsylvania model, is needed now more than ever. Thanks. Check, check. Is it on? Yep. Okay, all right. Uh, with regard to the uh, litigation of, on the Muslim ban and the executive order, uh, you said you were somewhat prepared. Was the government prepared for that litigation at that time? Um, <clears throat> absolutely not. And I'll give you an example um, to illustrate that. Um, that Saturday night hearing, um, the judge asked the government, to explain what the basis was for, um, the, for the order. <clears throat> there were lawyers from the Department of Justice in DC who were um, participating by phone. And essentially what they said is we're not prepared to address that question. Now, th that's not so dissimilar from the DACA termination, actually, where even when they stated reasons, this, you, know, you push on them a little bit and, and they collapse. But no the lawyers were not prepared to stand up in federal court and say this is the basis for the policy that we just announced that is resulting in people being put on planes, potentially being sent back to their debts. Um, and that was frankly a big reason that the injunction was issued because um, at that stage of litigation where what we were seeking was a f effectively a temporary restraining order, um, there were three factors for the court to consider. <clears throat> One is the risk of irreparable harm. The second is whether it's in the public interest. And the third is um, the likelihood of success on the merits. Well, there really was no conversation to be had about the merits because the government didn't give a countervailing argument. And um, the risk of irreparable harm was enormous. It was off the charts. And so that is part of what I think made it actually an easy call um, legally for the judge to issue that decision. Now I say legally because politically it was a hard call. Politically it was the first week of a brand new administration after a very contentious election and there was no way to do this without this entire case being viewed through a lens of politics. But legally I think it actually was an easy call and the fact that the government lawyers like the rest of the government was unprepared for that moment is, is part of what made it easy. Is it on? Yep. 
with respect to the reduction in the numerical caps on uh, refugees that you mentioned at the beginning that went from, I guess, 110,000 to 50,000. Um, I'm curious, I, I've been doing some work with refugee resettlement work around here, mm -hmm. and what I've noticed is that the flow has, seems to have been reduced to a trickle uh, at this point, uh, not just by half. And I'm wondering if you have any sense of what's going on with that uh, and what, if anything, might be going on to try to uh, sort of in court to uh, address what seems to be uh, a reduction that goes even beyond those caps. Yeah, I, I don't, um, I can't speak to the, to the numbers on the ground, <clears throat> but um, I guess I would answer the question this way. The numeric cap, the reduction in the numeric cap, was one of several moves that were taken um, in tandem. And so the increased vetting, which is part of um, uh, each of these Muslim ban orders as well, is again, by design, uh, intended to slow down the number of people who can actually pass through the system. Um, we have some reason to believe that even in the absence of a formal ban, um, informally, that uh, uh, the that government officials um, may be slowing the processing of applications. Um, there's a number of things that are hard to establish um, empirically, although there's a lot of work being done to try to do that. The, the whole question of how that limit got set, uh, by statute, the president is supposed to consult with Congress in making that designation, the annual designation. There's no evidence to suggest that he did that. And so that actually, that issue has been part of the, the litigation as well. Um, I, I don't know what else is going on on the litigation front to address um, the current operation of the overseas refugee program. But it is a very live and, and active area, as it should be, because the idea that we would cut by more than 50% the number of refugees that we're accepting when you open up the paper and see what is going on in terms of refugee crises around the world is astonishing and heartbreaking. And I think that we will look back on this day and you know, this period 20 years from now and we'll say it was immoral. I think we'll look back on it the same way that we look back on an earlier period of American history where we turned back a boatload of refugees, uh, Jewish refugees, fleeing Europe and essentially condemned them to their death. This is that moment. It's happening in our lives. Um, the language of national security, the, the boogeyman of terrorists lurking under, you know, behind, uh, uh, you know, uh, in every dark corner. Um, the idea that our country is being taken away from us. I think we're at a place where we have to learn how to see through that and understand that these were the kinds of things that we're saying when we turned back a shipload of, of Jewish refugees fleeing the Nazis. Um, I honestly don't know how we can, in the same moment, maintain a sense of moral indignation at the use of chemical weapons against children in Syria and then turn away children from Syria. The question I was going to ask you was, um, you mentioned the Immigration Reform, Immigration Act of 1924. Was that ever challenged in court? And I think I know the answer, but it's not from any knowledge of the law. It's from knowledge of the fact that boatload of Jews were sent back to their deaths 10 years later. Uh, what happened as the outgrowth of the 1924 Immigration Act? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I don't know <clears throat> that there was any litigation um, of the issue. I mean, and, and if there was, I, am, I feel reasonably comfortable predicting that it would have been, um, that, that it was unsuccessful. The reason being that um, the, the executive has enormous authority. Um, the way that our constitutional system has been interpreted by the courts, the executive has enormous authority in setting the limits of 
um, overall limits of immigration and um, uh, country by country designations. Um, it's understood to be part of the sovereign power of the country, is understood to relate to um, power over international relations. And so when in subsequent decades there have been legal challenges, they've almost um, always failed um, out of a deference to the executive in making those kinds of determinations. Now, <clears throat> what's a little bit different is that by statute, the Immigration and Nationality Act prohibits discrimination in the application of these laws. And so that's one um, statutory provision that's been brought into the Muslim ban litigation. But leaving that aside as a constitutional matter, um, historically the courts have given a lot of deference to um, the executive in making these kinds of designations. The way that the 1924 Act was dealt with was political rather than um, uh, through the courts. Um, it was rolled back um, over a series of decades that culminated in 1965 with the Immigration Act of 1965, and Nationality Act of 1965, <clears throat> which provided the basic architecture for, for our current immigration law. And one thing that the 1965 Act did is it did away with these national origins quotas. Um, but that was a long political process. And most historians will say that that had a lot to do with two things. One was a civil rights movement. Um, because the civil rights, so the Immigration and Nationality Act was in 1965, right? The Civil Rights Act in 1964, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, other civil rights legislation of the 60s. And that same, those same kinds of political demands for racial equality, um, historians, many believe, informed um, immigration reform as well. The other historical phenomenon that historians point to in explaining why it is that the 65 Act came around when it did was the Cold War. <clears throat> because equality claims were, um, had a resonance not just domestically but internationally. And every instance of social or racial or ethnic or religious inequality that existed in the United States was being used as a propaganda tool by the Soviets in, uh, uh, in the course of the Cold War. But that's a political and historical story much more than a legal story. <clears throat> 